This is the brutal reality of being an officer in Mexico. Even a short street arrest, perhaps a small-time seller, can lead to an all-out war with their cartel. Throughout the last decades, people have argued that cartels are in control of the Mexican government, not the other way around. So if you're on the right side of justice, it's gonna be really dangerous to try and stop cartels. They're powerful, violent, and armed to the teeth with paramilitary equipment. And in July, footage had emerged of that CGNG convoy. These gunmen call themselves the elite group and pledge allegiance to El Mencho. Sometimes the fight between Sicarios and authorities escalates to a point of no return, and it's often innocent civilians who are caught in the most brutal scenarios imaginable. I found myself by 2012 um, in a morgue in Monterrey um, with 49 bodies who'd all been dictated. Many areas in Mexico are a constant war zone thanks to cartels. Let's explore one of the worst machine gun wars in recent history and see how it connects to the current context. It was July 3rd, 2020 in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, when military troops were conducting surveillance tours to inhibit criminal acts, but they couldn't take their mission to an end. Instead, they were attacked by one of the groups they were seeking to destroy, CDN, or Cartel del Noreste. The army said it was monitoring the neighborhood of Fresnos, a 10-mile drive from the Juarez-Lincoln International Bridge, which connects the United States and Mexico over the Rio Grande, when they were met with fire from Sicarios using military weapons. These weren't just any CDN gunmen, they were the Tropa del Infierno, translated as the Troops from Hell. They are the CDN's most violent hit squad, known for brutal attacks, oftentimes unprovoked. Well, in their eyes, the very existence of an army is a provocation. The CDN, much like any other cartel, wants authorities gone or in their pockets. So any patrol car or army truck snooping around warrants a green light to kill. The CDN had a couple of silver pickup trucks that the army immediately recognized, but they weren't fast enough to avoid their bullets. When one hell troop noticed the army trucks, he started raining fire on them, much like a pack of dogs. As soon as one Sicario started firing, several more turned up to make sure the army troops were destroyed, but they were wrong in doing that. The troops came back with an even stronger force. Eventually, the cartel pickup truck came to a full stop, and footage shows a soldier reloading his rifle and continuing to fire. Four military vehicles arrived at the scene, and soldiers continued to shoot, despite no response from the cartel. Finally, a soldier orders everyone to stand down, shouting, hey, stop, don't shoot. The body camera later showed at least 10 soldiers surrounding the hit squad's pickup before someone shouts, he's alive. Another soldier standing nearby is then heard yelling, kill that motherfucker!" before additional shots are fired. Although the full video has not yet been released to the public, there are photos of the aftermath and it's simply brutal. We can see that the CDN did not fare that well in this fight. They thought they could just take some soldiers down, but they were not prepared for war. Instead, the military called for backup and, well, they had machine gun trucks. However, we can also see the heavy artillery the Hell troops were carrying with them at the time of the attack. In another context, they could have easily won the battle and left dozens of casualties as they normally do. Here's a sad twist. Nine Sicarios died as a result of this short battle, but three civilians died too. They were being held captive by the CDN, which has the nasty habit of kidnapping for ransom. 19-year-old Arturo Garza, 18-year-old Damian Tercero, and his little brother, 16-year-old Alejandro Tercero, had all been reported missing by their families just days before. Raul Tercero, the brother's father, was devastated to learn about his son's deaths from TV. I will never see my son again. What I want is justice to be served, for those soldiers to pay. It's interesting, he doesn't want cartels to pay for snatching his sons in the first place, but the soldiers who took their lives. Situations like this are always murky. The military troops couldn't just not shoot back when the CDN was already firing rounds at them, but perhaps they could have been more careful and approached the CDN pickup trucks more slowly to check for civilians before they rained complete hell on them. More than 200 shots were fired at the pickup truck. Soldiers recovered a dozen assault rifles, including two Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifles and eight AR-15 rifles. During President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador's daily press briefing at the National Palace in Mexico City, Defense Secretary General Luis Crescencio Sandoval said that at least 24 soldiers are being investigated for their role in the incident. The United Nations Commission for Human Rights in Mexico has called for a full-blown investigation into the military's operation and called their actions worrisome. Now, here's the question. If this is who you're fighting, do you have time to be careful or gentle? Here's a sobering stat. 
Despite the fact that El Champo has been in prison now for more than two years, the violence in Mexico has actually increased, breaking a record 31,174 murders in 2017. Governments have been declaring war on drugs since Nixon did it in 1971, trying to curb the rising white powder epidemic in the U.S., but not one war on drugs has proved effective. In fact, after it kicked off in Mexico in 2006, violence only skyrocketed. Then you start seeing some crazy stuff there, these houses with like 30 people tied up and you know kidnapped. You start to see the mass graves at the beginning, they were like, you know, a house with 15 bodies it was a big deal. You know, later on, it would be like filled with 298 bodies. Well, drug traffickers won't just stop producing or selling just because the government is threatening them with more prison time. They already know what they're doing is illegal. And the profits are so big that no threat is going to intimidate the kingpins. Also, the profits are so big that the government becomes interested in them. Reportedly, the CIA, the FBI, and even the DEA have allowed drugs to come into the U.S. with various motivations, catch the big fish, stop another type of drug from reaching the country, etc. And in Mexico, several high-ranking politicians are in the cartel's pockets, earning a percentage of everything they make. So the war on drugs is not without some serious flaws. December 2006, you saw Felipe Calderón become president and he launched his military crackdown on drug cartels and I was covering that. You suddenly saw the real explosion of the, the, the body count really taking off, the level of weaponry really taking off. Went to this town called El Pozo and there'd been two massacres there. We went just after the second massacre there and there was still all the bullets laid out and they really hadn't cleaned up the scene. Journalist Ioan Grio saw all the residents of El Pozo flee their homes like refugees with nothing more than a backpack. Some had been there their whole lives. Some had never left the village. Their lives were turned upside down. They had to run for their lives. Wow, this, this is gonna destabilize the country. And it did. El Pozo was far from the only village lost to a war. El agua se convirtió en un pueblo fantasma. Las casas, pues ya no son las mismas. Todas están balaseadas. In 2019, the CJNG, or Jalisco New Generation Cartel, claimed the entire city of El Aguaje. As they fought the United Cartels over territory, the actual residents of El Aguaje fled for their lives. The CJNG claimed homes and turned them into headquarters, and of course, claimed all smuggling routes and avocado farms in the region. The El Aguaje residents fled for their lives. They could never return, either. Not with their homes destroyed and sicarios patrolling the streets 24-7. So it became a ghost town, like many other places in Mexico. Other people live in a constant state of fear, as war looms over their heads on a daily basis. And they know it can start at any given time. They've been dropping bombs from the drones, and we have the military right here, but it does seem like they, they're interested in talking, stopping the other guys from uh, dropping all those bombs. They're dropping drone bombs just over there? Yeah, that just happened today. They dropped like five bombs today. If a battle breaks out between Sicarios and the military, civilian casualties are a given. When there's machine guns, armored trucks, and bombs involved, it's hard to tell an enemy from a friend. And what's left after a war is hard to describe. You know, the stench of death and like, what the hell am I covering? You know, what, you know, what, am, I, what am I following here? Without journalists like Iowan, people might not even believe this is happening. It's hard to fathom. These are real things happening to real people when your life is safe and you don't see bodies on your way to school or work. But here's a rough fact. In many parts of Mexico, children do see things like these on their way to school. Take the avocado wars, for example. There is such a thing as the avocado wars in Michoacan. The reason? Everything that produces money, they're going to be interested in. We often call cartels drug cartels, but they make money from practically any source they can find. The Mexican state of Michoacan is the world's number one producer and supplier of avocados. Michoacan has the perfect soil and climate to grow the fruit that has taken over the world in the last few decades. Avocado consumption in the United States tripled between 2001 and 2023. Canada imports 100,000 tons of avocado each year. Almost half a million people have jobs insured by the avocado industry in Mexico. You'd think this is great news for the people, but because of the CJNG, Sinaloa, and other smaller cartels, they are in constant danger. The cartels attacked farmers, stole their fruit, and extorted their business. They said they were going to throw a party for us, that we were going to dance to their tunes. What does that mean? 
throw a party es cuando They say they are going to throw a party when they are going to disappear a person. Desaparición de una persona. That's the kind of threat that keeps you up at night. Gabriel was forced to make a deal with a rival cartel, paying them to protect him and his family from the threatening cartel. Willingly or unwillingly, most avocado farmers in Mexico became a part of the cartels. They either side with them or end up dead. But this only made the cartels more confident that they could have a monopoly over the avocado industry. And as avocados became more and more popular, their prices went up, and so did the cartel violence. All this crime is a consequence of the increase of price of avocado. Now all of this has exploded. The extortion, kidnappings, you have to pay for protection. I'm afraid of losing my family or having them lose me. In 2019, the CJNG invaded Uruapan to take control of its booming avocado industry. Within a few days, they left bits and pieces from 19 bodies across the town. Six of them were left hanging from a bridge. In Michoacan, the avocado industry, first they start like taxing them with like 10% of their gains. And then they say like, why well, is it not easier just to take over? Give me like the property titles or I, or I will kidnap your daughter. I will uh, extort you. If you don't, I'm gonna shoot you. We've seen perhaps 150 Mexican journalists who have been murdered since 2000. Um, I knew personally you know, two of them. No one is safe from the war on drugs. Civilians end up collateral damage or ransom material. And journalists are constant targets for cartels. There's a sad reason for this. Journalists expose the cartel's crimes, but also the government's involvement in this. Mexico's Institutional Revolutionary Party, or the PRI, is notoriously intertwined with the Mexican Mafia. The PRI has controlled Mexico's government for 60 years and has repeatedly been accused of super high-level corruption linked to drug trafficking and organized crime. The ex-president's brother, Raul Salinas de Gortari, was arrested in 1995 after actively collaborating with the Gulf Cartel for over a decade. He'd made outrageous sums of money by protecting the cartel, all the while posing as a clean political figure. But in the 1990s, cartel violence was nowhere near as rough. The PRI had a sort of unwritten agreement with the cartels. Cause no ruckus in the country, and we allow you to do your business. When the US started putting pressure on Mexico to sort out its cartel problem, the PRI seemed to carry out such missions, filming and reporting success after success. In reality, they were maintaining a good relationship with the cartels and presenting a few minor success stories to make it look like they were actively fighting them. This way, the government increased in wealth and power over the decades, and the U.S. government forgot about Mexico for a while. It was only when cartels actually started posing a threat to Mexico's population that the government thought they'd better start the infamous war on drugs. By the 2000s, cartels got so rich that they had legit influence over the government and its people. Sadly, it was a bit too late to curb their growth now. The war on drugs means more violence against cartels, but they are better at it than the government and even the Mexican military. The Jalisco New Generation Cartel took the fight to the next level, shooting down a military helicopter with a rocket-propelled grenade. The violence skyrocketed to shocking levels. Year after year, the record for number of homicides in Mexico renewed. Almost 40,000 lives were lost in 2018. And all that violence is only to have leverage in the negotiations with the um, government, with politicians, right? They create this chaos to, to, to go and sit with a local politician and say like, okay, do you want more or shall we negotiate this? Mexican cartels still employ what Pablo Escobar called Plata or Plomo, silver or lead. So an officer, judge or politician can accept their bribe or get a bullet. Sometimes, people on the right side of the law get intimidated and threatened into corruption. Others are happy to jump at the opportunity to make more money, and illegal money tends to come in bigger quantities. That means that somebody who's working right alongside the commander is presumably getting paid by the cartels. This is kind of a blatant sign of corruption, isn't it? According to several reports, all Mexican cartels pay hefty sums to the government to stay in business. That way, their smuggling routes are protected and their violence goes unpunished. And of course, the bigger the cartel, the greater its connections to high-ranking officers and politicians. This way, they always know the authorities' plans and can attack first. Over the last few years, many officers were arrested for delivering information straight to the CJNG. 
The office said, Jalisco Local Police Coordinator Severo Flores Mendoza provides law enforcement information to CJNG in exchange for bribes. Violence and corruption have been critical to CJNG's growth in the past decade. Now, Mexico is a kind of a basket case of corruption. You know, you had this, this, this cop called, uh, his nickname was El Tyson in Michoacan, training youngsters to lose their fear of blood. There's no denying that corruption makes the war on drugs even more brutal. It's hard to see a solution to the brutal wars that cost lives every day in Mexico. How do you make a functional justice system and keep it in a place where cartels can threaten people into obedience or tempt them with huge chunks of untaxed money? And how can you prevent more children from being recruited into bloody cartels, forced to do the unthinkable, and desensitized to the most horrific kind of violence by the time they're teenagers? Thankfully, there will always be those fighting for what's right. Uncorrupt authorities, journalists, and politicians with plans for better, stricter policies. But will the war on drugs ever end? Hey, thanks for watching. It's tough to think of all the horrors happening in other parts of the world right now, but maybe we all have to think to find a solution together. What do you think should be done to help put an end to the brutal war on drugs between Sicarios and authorities? Let me know in a comment, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time.